Good Sunday morning to each and every one of you from the Florence International Church in Florence, Italy. I'm Pastor Randy McGeehy and I am delighted to welcome you today to our message for this week and we trust that it will be a source of encouragement and challenge to you as we look together to God's Word regarding our lives and the moment and day in which we are now living. We will begin the message here in just a few moments after we have a bit of worship from our archives collection and we trust you'll just sit back now and be a part of that worship service and open your spirit and your heart to what God has for us today. I believe the Holy Spirit will speak to us all as we come together in the precious name of Jesus.
message that was entitled Canaan land is just in sight and it is based on the passage of scripture from Joshua chapter 1 and verses 1 through 9. I will not reread those today you can look those up if you missed uh, the message last week and I encourage you to do so but today we will just simply enter into the second part of this message from that passage of scripture. Let's understand that the book of Joshua is a book about transitions. I think all of us today can understand the term transitions because each and every one of us today is in a time and in a moment where we are experiencing many, many transitions in our own life. The book of Joshua is about battles. It's about uh, many, many things, and including victories. It is a book about the people of God getting their hands on everything the Lord has for them, something that I believe we need to take careful note of in this moment of time for ourselves. It speaks to us because it is a book about moving past the problems of yesterday into the peace and the blessings of today. And friends, make no mistake about the fact 
that with all of the problems that we are experiencing in this current day, there are blessings and there is peace ahead for us if we will lay claim to it in the name of Jesus. As the book opens, we are introduced to a new leader in Israel. Moses, the man of God, has died and God has called Joshua to lead the nation into the blessed promised land. The first nine verses of chapter one concern God's call of Joshua and of his reassurances to the new leader of Israel that God himself will be with Joshua to lead him and use him and bless him. Now the focus turns from Joshua to the nation as a whole. God is speaking to a people who are ready to receive the land that God had promised to Abram hundreds of years earlier. Forty years earlier, God had delivered the previous generation from bondage in Egypt. God brought them out through a series of miracles and other great demonstrations of his power and of his glory. It took that generation two years to come to a place called Kadesh Barnea. They could have made the journey in, frankly, 11 days, but God led them through the wilderness so they would not have to face the enemy nations of Canaan very quickly. When Israel arrived at the Jordan River at Kadesh, they were commanded to enter the Promised Land. But instead they begged God to allow them to send spies into the Canaan to see what the land was like. God granted their request, so twelve spies spent forty days looking over the Canaan land. Ten of those spies came back with a negative report as is described to us in Numbers chapter 13 verses 26 through 29. They told of the glories of Canaan, but their report was based on fear and not upon faith. They were afraid of the giants who inhabited the land as talked about in Numbers 13, 31 through 33. Caleb and Joshua and the other two spies came back with a report based instead of on, in fear, in faith. They spoke of the spies, but they also knew that God was able to give the land to Israel in spite of the obstacles they would face talked about in Numbers 13, verse 30. Caleb and Joshua challenged the people to go forward and to claim the land they had been given by the Lord. In chapter 14, the people refused to go forward. They wanted to return to Egypt instead. Imagine that. Because of their refusal to follow him in faith, God condemned them to wander in the wilderness for 38 more years until that faithless generation had passed off. The generation that came out of Egypt was like many who are living in this day, in this moment, in this time, right now. They became sanctified obstructionists who tried to stand in the way of everything God was doing. They are like the deacon told about once in a church who was against his church plans to build a new educational building. In a fit of anger, he said, that building will be built over my dead body. And then he stormed out of the room. Three days later, he died of a massive heart attack, and the church went ahead with the building plans. Hear me, friends. It's dangerous to stand in the way of God's plan 
and God's purpose. So now that the old generation is dead, and God is about to lead the new generation into the promised land, the only remaining members of the previous generation, Caleb and Joshua, are set to lead the people into their inheritance. Before Joshua leads Israel into Canaan, he addresses Israel to challenge them in some very important areas. What Joshua says to Israel and how they respond to his words have some truths I believe to teach us today in this moment of time. Like Israel, we have been promised victory and blessings such as described in Ephesians 1.3. Like Israel, we must be properly prepared before we can claim the victory that is truly ours. So let's examine these verses together for a moment as we consider again the thoughts that Canaan is just in sight. And notice the lessons that we find in these particular verses. Verses 10 through 15, Joshua has a challenge. After Joshua receives his challenge from the Lord, without hesitation, he goes to the people and tells them that the time has come to take the land. And we find that in verses 10 through 11, that challenge, first of all, begins with the challenge of readiness. Joshua tells the people to get ready to go into Canaan and claim their land. These were the words they had been living for for 40 years now. However, before they could go in, they had to get ready to go. God told them to prepare them some food. The manna was about to stop. God had told them that he would give them manna when they were in the desert, but it would cease when they entered the promised land. The manna was desert diet. They were about to move up to something a whole lot better. They were going to a land flowing with milk and honey. And what had worked in the wilderness would not suffice in the land of blessing. Before we can enter our Canaan, we have to make the proper preparations to do so. The way we live must change. The things we feed on must change. Our priorities and our passions must be brought in line with the will of God. The entire scope of our lives must be altered to adjust to living differently than the world around us lives. This is why so many never enjoy today a victorious Christian life. They simply refuse to make the necessary changes to adjust to living in a spiritual victory. The fact is, if you expect to walk in victory, you will have to learn to walk by an entirely different set of rules. Romans 6, 4 says we also should walk in newness of life. What will you have to do to get ready for Canaan in your life today? Verses 12 through 15 speak of a challenge to responsibility. Now Joshua addresses the tribes of Reuben and Gad and that half-tribe of Manasseh. These tribes had sought and gotten permission from Moses to remain east of the Jordan, just outside the Promised Land. Why did they make this request? The land east of Jordan was a land that was good for raising cattle. Still, 
Joshua reminds them that they had promised to fight alongside their brethren until the land was conquered. And these people are challenged to remember their promise and to aid the nation until victory was secured. While these people settled in a land of prosperity, they were also in a land of danger. These tribes were the first to go away into captivity when the Assyrian army attacked Israel from the east. Friends, there's a very powerful lesson for us in these verses today. We have legions of Christians who are just like these two and a half tribes. They are more concerned about making a living than they are about making a life. The primary thing that motivates them is getting ahead. Getting ahead in life as they see it. In other words, they are materially minded. They are not spiritually minded. These people represent those Christians called borderline Christians. They may talk the talk. They may make gestures and signs that most would look at them and say, oh, you're a Christian. They know the things to do and say that give the right appearance. But when it comes down to the heart and the reality of living truly as believers, they miss the mark. Borderline. These are people who have trusted Jesus for salvation, but that is about as far as they truly are willing to go. They attend church, at least when they want to, or when maybe it's convenient or they have little else to do. They give and tithe when they feel that they can afford to, when there's not something else that they feel justified in spending the money for, instead of giving God what truly is His to begin with, the tithe is the Lord's. They may even fight a battle now and again. But most often they just play around the edges of the spiritual, refusing to put God first in their life. When the enemies of Israel attacked from the east, the tribes who lived east of the Jordan were the first to fall. The same is true of those Christians who refused to go all the way in their commitment to the Lord in this day and in this age. They are usually the first to fall in times of attack and times of temptation. People who live like that could say anything they want to, but the truth is obvious. They have other gods in their lives to whom they bow and serve. If we really love God, we need to make up our minds to cross on over into the place of victory the Lord has truly prepared for us. Make the decision today to leave behind that that is holding you back from serving God like you should. It's something that we all must do. Make Matthew 16, 24, which says, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That needs to be a reality in our lives today. Consider also what Jesus said in Luke 14, 26 through 27. If any man come to me and hate not his 
father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. We can look at it any way we please, friends, but many today are choosing gold and other worldly things over God. If you refuse to line up with the will of God for your life, then you can be assured of the fact that one day you will fall. My friends, you cannot play around the edge of this long before you fall out of the will of God. So we've talked about in this message last week and this week, God's command. We have just reviewed Joshua's challenge. And thirdly, from verses 16 through 18, we need to look at Israel's commitment. Verse 16 shows us they commit to a life of surrender. These people make their stand with the Lord. They promise absolute obedience and surrender to the will of God. You see, this is the only way spiritual victory will come to any of our, any of our lives. We must, we must look to obedience and surrender completely to the will of God. There must be total and absolute surrender of every area of life to the will of God and to His divine and perfect leadership. Anything less hinders the work of God in your life and mine. What are you holding back from the Lord today? I ask you to consider that and ask it of the Lord. Too often we are like the men described in Luke 9, 57 through 62. God's will is that we surrender our will and follow him to victory. That is his will for you today, friends. I challenge you to make a complete surrender to God today. Run up the white flag and get in line to go into your Canaan. Verse 17, they commit to a life of submission. These men also promise to follow the leadership of God's man. Just as they had followed Moses, they committed themselves to follow Joshua. And while I believe that there is a certain amount of authority invested in the pastoral office and that the people of God ought to follow the man of God as he follows God and his will for the church. There is a higher authority that every person listening today must acknowledge. We are to submit to the leadership of God. Too often we rebel against anything that seems like authority in our lives. None of us like to be told what to do, so to speak. But may I remind you that every single child of God listening in this message is a slave. When you got saved, you became the property of the Lord Jesus Christ, as is described in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 through 20. Therefore, you have no right. You have no privilege. You have no claim to anything that allows you to make decisions for yourself. Your entire duty could be summed up in one word. Submit. Submit. If you are ever going to get to Canaan, you will have to submit everything 
and your life to God. I ask you, have you done that today? Or are you holding things back from the Lord, as many do? Canaan is only for those who are subject to the will of God. Verse 18 says, they commit, they committed to a life of separation. Finally, the people committed themselves to separating from those in their midst who refused to comply with the commandments of the Lord. And their separation was so strong that they vowed to put to death anyone who rebelled against the leadership of Joshua. These people knew that allowing rebellion in their midst was a sure way to guarantee defeat. Again, the lesson for us here, I believe, is very clear. If we want to walk in victory, we must practice separation in our lives as well. We should separate ourselves from anything that would prevent us from achieving victory, God's victory in our life. It may be that certain people have to go. It may be that certain activities have to be cut out of our lives. We may need to consider the way we dress, the way we talk, the things we watch, the things that we do, where we work, how we think or any other areas of life. It is a hindrance to your entering into Canaan land when you don't. These things must go. Otherwise, you will always be defeated and you will always be in danger. Even as I speak, I believe you already know what it is that is holding you back today. Most do. They just don't want to admit to it or recognize it. You need to get those things settled, friends. You need to get on your knees before God and allow Him to help you settle those areas. Canaan land is just in sight. It's just in sight for you today. The Heavenly Father has given us a place of victory and all that remains is for us to march in and claim it for ourselves. While it is ours, I want you to know it is not cheap. If you really want to walk in spiritual victory today and live in Canaan land, then you will have to pay a price to do so. We do not have to be defeated in sin. We don't have to be defeated by life. We don't have to be defeated by spiritual depression or by the devices of the enemy of our soul. We can walk in victory today. We can do it, my friends. You can do it. If we are going to do that, though, we must make the necessary changes that will allow us to achieve that goal. If I were going to run in a marathon, many things in my life would have to change. <laughs> Trust me, many things would have to change. I'm not to prepare to run that kind of race today. If I'm going to be victorious as a Christian, I must also examine my life and change everything that hinders me from walking in absolute victory as a child of the King. Christian friend, I ask you, what is it going to take to get you to Canaan today? Are you willing to pay the price, whatever that price might be? 
Or would you rather stay on the other side of Jordan and be the first to fall in times of trial? You see, the decision is yours. You just have to make the choice. Others listening today in this message may have never been saved at all. If you were to die in this moment, you would go to hell. And you don't want that to happen, my friend. Trust me. It is not a place that you want to be. You do not need victory today, but instead you need salvation. I would like to invite you to come to the Lord Jesus today and be saved. To put your faith and your trust in His wonderful gift of salvation, that your name would be recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, and that one day when you pass from this life into eternity, you will pass through the pearly gates of heaven, and there you will reside with Jesus forever. He loves you. He died for you. And He will save you if you will come to Him, confess Him as Lord and as Savior, ask His forgiveness for the sin in your life, and then choose to live each day forward for the glory of God. It's not hard. The devil will tell you that it is. But the reality is Jesus did the work for you. All you have to do is make the right choice today. I want to pray today for each and every one of you, whether you're a Christian, a child of God, needing to make choices so that you can cross the Jordan into your Canaan, or whether today you need to choose Jesus as Lord, Savior, and soon-coming King of your life. Either way, God is here for you today, and I want us to take this moment and pray together. Father, we are so grateful today that we can come to you with anything and know that not only do you hear our prayers, but Lord, it is your heart and your desire to minister to our lives that we might find victory in Jesus. Lord, for those believers today that are struggling in setting aside those things that hinder their life and keep them from crossing their Jordan into their land of Canaan, I would pray today that your Holy Spirit would speak to them in this moment and reveal to them those things that are hindrances and hold them back and then help them to make right choices from this moment so that they will live in the victory that you have set aside for them in their life. Lord, in this moment, we all need victory. And the reality is the victory is there. We simply must make choices that are right and good in your sight, Lord, and not necessarily in ours. Lord, for anyone listening to this message today whose life is not in your hands, they either have never received you as Savior or maybe they have at some point and they've turned their back and walked away. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus right now that they will take this moment, they will bow their heart and their head to you, and they will receive you as Savior and as Lord in prayer. They will receive your forgiveness today for the sin that they have committed, and they will make a commitment to you today to live for you from this day forward for your glory and for purposes. Lord, I know you'll forgive. 
You promised that. That's your heart. That's why you made a way. And today I pray for anyone listening in this service that has not done that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for doing everything you, you can and will do to help us to find victory and to find salvation through you. We ask it in the precious and most wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you today for joining us for this message. We trust that it has spoken to your heart today. And we at the Florence International Church want you to know that we are here to do anything we can to support you and to help you in your walk of faith. If you have prayer needs, I invite you to either email us or, or make a comment through the, uh, the website or uh, this, our Facebook page and let us know you desire prayer, and I can assure you that we will be more than happy. We will be, in fact, very privileged to pray with you and for you in this moment. You can reach us by email at the Florence International Church dot gmail dot com, or you may reach us through the contact information on our website. Please remember that we will be back on this coming Wednesday morning with a devotional thought on our Facebook page at Florence International Church with a short devotional that we pray will be inspirational to you and help you to live your week for the glory of God. And then we will return again next Sunday morning at 8.45 a.m. Central European time with another message from the Lord for you. And we invite you to join us there at www.florenceinternationalchurch.com or again, you can find the link on our Facebook page at Florence International Church. We're so privileged and blessed to have shared these moments with you today, and we trust that you will look to the Lord in your life in this moment and endeavor to make your life pleasing unto Him. He loves you, and He wants to help you walk each day in your victory and in His. God bless you today from the Florence International Church in Florence, Italy.